Hello, friends. We're going to go ahead and go live here. It's scheduled for 8.05 and it's 8.01, but uh, there just might be people out there at 8 o'clock. So uh, I want to do, I want to honor you all and uh, <clears throat> be here in time for that to happen. I guess it helps to put on the microphone. I am so, so, so excited. Um, so we, uh, just one second, let me get this microphone kind of on the Google. There we go. So I just got back from church, and I'll have to redo it. Uh, I didn't get a chance to actually go to the reliquary. Uh, but tonight at my parish, we had uh, the exposition of sacred relics. So, uh, <clears throat> And uh, these are all on loan to us from the Vatican. Hi, Scott. And so there are several, uh, several relics. To all, there, there are, uh, and in the Catholic Church, we have first, second, and third class relics. Uh, so a first class relic is an actual piece of the body uh, of a saint. And then second class is something that they owned. And then third class is something that was touched. Uh, so, you know, th and tonight we had almost 120 first class and, and uh, second class relics. <clears throat> first class relics, piece of the uh, uh, actual cross as defined by St. Helen, <clears throat> who was Constantine's mother. She went to Jerusalem and dug up uh, Golgotha and then had a sick woman laying on all the crosses until she found the one that healed her. And so that's what they call the true cross. So there's a piece of that that's available for viewing tonight. Um, you know, relics, uh, first class relics of all the saints, all, all 12 of the apostles. And just, it was just awesome. Just totally, totally awesome. Unbelievable. What a great evening. And um, I almost feel hypocritical because in the first, what we're going to be talking about here, the, uh, the, the first, uh, chapter that we'll be discussing are firearms for self-sufficiency and self-defense. Uh, but, you know, um, even, even Jesus told the disciples to sell their cloaks and buy a sword. So once they found out they had two swords with them before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said that'll be sufficient. So, you know, we, we do have to have uh, protective items with us. Uh, and I think especially at these uh, severe times. One of the things that's really going on strange, I don't know if you've heard the news about it or not, um, but uh, today we had an, a, a uh, uh, two, and I'm hoping they are rockets. Hello, John. Welcome. Uh, but evidently the news is saying that two rockets, uh, let, let's just call it two explosive devices um, from Russia hit Poland. And uh, now for 21 years, I was a, I was a Russian uh, ground forces analyst. Uh, so I worked primarily against the group of Soviet forces, Germany, the 20 divisions there, uh, five armies, 20 divisions. And then I worked against the northern group of forces, which had two Soviet divisions. And then the central group of forces had five Soviet divisions. So, I mean, for, for 21 years, I, I lived, ate, drank Russian equipment, Soviet equipment, Soviet uh, military and everything else. I'm hoping that it was a, uh, a rocket attack. I'm taking my shoes off to give my new titanium hip a little bit of a uh, ability to be folded up here. And ah, there we go. Uh, but anyhow, um, so I'm hoping that those are, are you know, something like uh, BM-27s, uh, which is a, a solid fueled rocket. And uh, so, you know, air density, uh, uh, miscalculations in air, air temperature, um, uh, speed, wind direction speed, what we call winds aloft, uh, can, can deviate the flight path of that. Now, remember, these are area weapons. They are not point weapons. So we don't have a particular target. Uh, the BM-21 Katyusha or Grad, uh, Grad in, in, in Russian means rain. Uh, well, actually, it means a hailstorm. Uh, rain is dodged. But uh, anyhow, so it's a hailstorm coming down, uh, 20, 20 rockets per uh, per BM-21. I'm sorry, no, BM-21 was 40 rockets. Uh, so, you know, so these are these are not guided. And so there's a lot of calculations going to it. So if you if if at the factory that the, the, the uh, 
uh, powder that the fuel wasn't compressed hard enough, that can cause a deviation in flight path. If there's underweight or overweight uh, fuel as far as the solid rocket fuel, that can cause a deviation in flight pattern. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that can cause a deviation in flight pattern. So if there was, there was a, a valid Ukrainian target close by and they had a couple of defective rockets, uh, then hopefully this was all a mistake and, and hopefully cooler heads will prevail. And so uh, let's pray for that. Let's pray for cooler heads and and this not be the beginning of a um, uh, of World War III. I, I, I pray for that. I, I pray that uh, Russia will make restitution to the families of those who perished and, uh, and reparations for the damages that were caused uh, to the owners of the property that was affected. But, you know, we shall see what, you know, tomorrow's another day and we'll have more information. We'll find out uh, a little bit more about what's going on. So let's just do a mic check real quick. Can you all hear me? Am I, uh, am I making sense? <laughs> and uh, so, John, Scott, if you can hear me, let me know, please. That would be fantastic. And since I'm not getting any response to that, I'm assuming that maybe my microphone isn't working. But we shall see. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started with chapter 11. And I didn't do any banners because I was at church. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Happy Hickman Homestead. Hello. Welcome. Great to see you. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with chapter 11, Firearms for Self-Sufficiency and Defense. I didn't do any banners because I was at church. So uh, my apologies for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's talking about selecting your, your armory and he says, you know, some of the requirements are that they have to be versatile. And then the second major consideration for survival guns is that they be robust and reliable enough to put up with constant carry and regular use. Uh, I'm going to say that most of the modern hunting guns, as well as the morning modern sporting rifles are pretty ro robust and they're going to stand up to, uh, uh, some mild abuse, uh, you know, what you would typically go through the brush hunting hunting animals and things like that so uh, you know I, I think they would withstand that so I, I have no problems with that uh, he talks about you may want to get uh, some exotic coatings uh, called metacol which are metal colors uh, if you intend to uh, and then he gives a, 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 a URL uh, for a company that sells these so you can camouflage your weapons if you want to um, I, you know, black to me, black is, is about as, as camouflage as you're going to get, uh, especially in a forested environment, uh, probably even in nighttime, especially. Uh, so I'm not that concerned about uh, camouflage patterns on my, on my weapons or anything else. <clears throat> um, but he seems to think that that's fairly important. Um, he, he likes, uh, small, uh, he, he says, consider, and I, I think this is an assumption that you're going to be bugging out. And so consider what small country stores would have as far as ammunition. And so he says, you know, uh, stock ammo, like 22 long rifle, 308 Winchester, 30 out six, 12 gauge, probably wouldn't have some of the more exotic, uh, rounds, such as 264 Winchester Magnum, 300 Weatherby, or 28 gauge shotgun. Um, so let me tell you, I made a big mistake. This used to be a big discussion among preppers five years ago on what would be the most available calibers um, of, of ammunition uh, should SHTF happen. And I said, you know, the hunting calibers, you know, the 30 out six, the 30 30, the 308. Uh, the 270, the seven millimeter. I said, you know, those are such common hunting calibers. I can't see them going off the shelves at all. Uh, and I was totally wrong. Once, once the lockdown happened, uh, I could not find 3030 Winchester for almost two years. And now that I can find it, you know, it, it's ridiculously high. What was eight, $12 for a box is now $30, $32 for a box. It's just, it's just crazy. And so now here we are the second week of hunting season, deer hunting season in Texas, and I'm not out there hunting uh, simply because 
Uh, you know, 3030 Winchester is hard to come by. Uh, 308, I can get a hold, but, but you know, that's, uh, 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 and I could probably take the 308 out if I wanted to, but uh, that's a little bit more available. But I was totally wrong. It, it turned out that all the available calibers that we found during the lockdown uh, were the NATO calibers. So I would say if you're looking for convenience, and, and I guess that kind of makes sense that, uh, uh, you know, that the, the manufacturers are going to continue to manufacture, manufacture those things that they're going to sell to the military, and then any excess goes to the civilians. And so, you know, that's going to end up being the 7.62 by 51. It'll be the uh, uh, 5.56 five, or 223 is the civilian equivalent. Of course, uh, 7.6251 is also 308. Winchester equivalent and uh, nine millimeter handgun. <clears throat> so those are going to be your common calibers. I would say that you might want to have a weapon in those calibers simply because of the availability of ammunition. Now there's a nuance here. Remember uh, that <clears throat> that five five six two two three five five six has higher bore pressures than does two two three. So although they are they are considered interchangeable to a limited amount. Putting a 5.56 five, into a 3.223 two, two, three is dangerous. Putting a 2.223 two, three into a 5.56 five, five, is not dangerous uh, because the 2.223 two, has a lower pressure uh, when, uh, upon ignition and, and propelling the, uh, the, the, the actual uh, bullet. Now, the bullets are exactly the same. Uh, it's just the necking and the compression or, or the pressure of the two rounds that, that that's different. Uh, so, you know, running a couple of five, five, sixes through a two, two, three may eventually cause it to blow up. Now it's the exact opposite for 308762. The 308 has a slightly higher pressure uh, in, in when it combusts than does the 762. So, uh, you know, military and civilian is terrible when it's five, five, six. Uh, however, uh, military and civilian and civilian and military, it, well, it's military and civilian is safe with the 308. So 308 can do either one. Uh, so I, I strongly recommend a 308 caliber weapon uh, as part of your defense. Uh, you can get a, um, a semi-automatic sporting rifle in the AR-10, uh, but more commonly you're going to end up, you know, probably the most common uh, hunting rifle is going to be the Remington 700. Uh, that's probably one of the most reliable bolt action hunting rifles you're going to find. Uh, I also really like the Ruger American and the Ruger Gunsight Scout. So those are both, uh, fantastic weapons in the 308 caliber as well. Um, he talks about his own personal, uh, things. He likes the, the Thompson, uh, uh, center fire contender, uh, the G2. Now remember the Tom Thompson contender has interchangeable barrels. And so what you can do is you can uh, basically fire a single shot. Uh, I think there's about 14 different, let me see, he says here. Um, I know he put it in here somewhere. Uh, no, 20, there are 20 different chambers uh, for the uh, Thompson Center Fire Contender. So all the way from 22 long rifle up to uh, 45 Colt. And there's a special adapter so you can do the ACP of the 45 Colt. <clears throat> um, he says at the Rawls Ranch, uh, they carry Colt stainless steel cold cup, which is a, a Model 1911 replica, uh, the most successful 45 caliber ACP that there has been with Peckmire grips, extended slide releases, and Trigicom tritium uh, sights. So he's got really specked out 45 caliber uh, pistols that they carry at the ranch. Uh, now, I will tell you, um, I love 357 Magnum 338 Special. And when I go to my, my uh, brother-in-law's ranch, you know, there's, you always find rattlesnakes coiled up around the fence posts. Uh, and, and, you know, 357, 30, which also can chamber the 38 special is just a fantastic round. And it'll, uh, <clears throat> and they also have CCI snake shot in 357, 38 special. <clears throat> so that'll take care of a snake pretty well. Um, of course, the good shotgun will take care of, of a snake as well as that. Uh, he, he recommends a, uh, 223, 
um, which is the AR-15 or the Mini-14 um, for uh, lightweight duty as far as lightweight hunting. I, I, I think the 223 AR-15 style 556, uh, if you're hunting for purposes of eating and you hit something like a rabbit, it's going to tear it up and you're not going to have very much left to eat. Uh, I would rather use a 22 long rifle <clears throat> for small game than I would a 223 or an AR-15. Um, let me see. He, he recommends the L1A1 semi-auto chambered in 308 uh, with a scope. Uh, you know, I, I, I also highly recommend, as I said, the uh, the Remington uh, 700, the, the Ruger Gun Sight Scout, and the Ruger American are also phenomenal weapons and uh, rather inexpensive. I, I think um, the the Winchester 700, you can probably get it for around $300 and the same thing. The Gun Sight Scout, I think, was a little bit more expensive. I think it was about $580. And I think the uh, Ruger American is still selling in the low low. Low 400s, high 300s, but you can check me on that. Just go to Academy or any other uh, uh, provider of, of firearms and you can find the pricing on them. You can probably even get those at, I, I know for sure uh, that Walmart sells uh, Remington 700s. Uh, he talks about um, uh, over under guns, uh, you know, and, and those are a fantastic combination. I don't have one. I've never fired one. Uh, I have seen them, but I, I haven't uh, uh, I haven't had the opportunity to really evaluate those. But he, he recommends the Savage Model 24 series. The most common, of course, is a 22 long rifle uh, bolt action over a 410 uh, shotgun. So you have a combination of a 22 and a 410. It's kind of like a survival rifle. Uh, they also have 22 over 20 gauge, 22 Magnum over 410 and 357 Magnum over 20 gauge. I am, you know, if, if I could find a decent uh, carbine uh, pistol combination um, that was in a readily available caliber, I would strongly recommend that. Um, and John H., I, thank you. I, I noticed your, your, your uh, comment here. And yes, I agree. The 308 is a fantastic uh, caliber. And it can fire the 762, which is a NATO round. And so, yes, I think that is a very wise decision to have a 308 um, in your inventory. Um, and so he's talking about long range rifles, of course, the bolt action rifle chamber in 308 or 30 out six. Uh, like I said, the 30 out six round during the, lock the lockdown, I could not find any. The 30 30, I could not find any. Uh, I don't have any of the other calibers. So, uh, you know, those two, I know for a fact I could not find and, and was looking for them. Um, then he talks about shotguns. He talks about the uh, uh, Model 870, Remington, the Remington 870 and the Remington 8 1100. Now, the difference between the two is uh, the Remington 870 is a pump action. The Remington 1100 is a semi-automatic uh, I am of the belief, my personal belief, and take it for what it's worth, that the fewer moving parts, the better off you're going to be as far as a dependable, long-term, long-lasting uh, firearm. And so I have all 870s. I don't have uh, any 1100s. I, I, I would rather have the simplicity of the pump action. Uh, another good one is the Mossberg 500. Uh, which it, I, I think it's almost a, uh, a patent infringement on the 870, but both of those are fantastic weapons, and I would strongly recommend them. If you're going to use it for uh, for hunting, especially if you're going to use it for dove or quail or any of the flying uh, targets, I recommend the longer barrel uh, so you get a little bit more range out of it. Uh, if you're going to be using it for turkey, squirrel, uh, any of the ground uh, targets, you can get by with a shorter barrel. Of course, if you're going to use it for self-defense, then you want the shortest barrel. You have to have 18 inches uh, in order to be legal. So, um, you know, you want it as short as possible, but still within the legal realm if you're going to be using it for a self-defense weapon. And uh, it's not a blunderbuss. 
So, so you know, that's something I think we all have to take into consideration. You see these movies where they're just kind of in the general direction of. Uh, I have a fantastic thing that we did on the range where basically it shows the, the blast pattern, a double, double aught at various ranges. And um, at 25 yards, I mean, it's, it's barely um, uh, about 8 to 10 inches. This is about the shot group at, at 25 yards so um, for double aught. Uh, so it's not a blunderbuss. It, 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 that's, and that was with a modified choke. <clears throat> so, you know, um, don't think it's a scatter gun. You've got to aim it. It does have a sights on them. Uh, now, the, the shorter barrel ones probably do not because you're not looking. Those are going to be a, have a little bit larger of, of a blast effect, let's call it, of, of a, a shot pattern uh, than will the longer barrel ones, especially if you have chokes on them. He says one that um, deserves special attention is the 410 cage uh, Snake Charmer 2 single shot shotgun made by Sport Arms of Florida. Uh, it's lightweight, 18-inch barrel, 28 and a half inches overall, which is the, the bare minimum length to be legal. Uh, very maneuverable, very, very handy. Uh, makes for a fantastic self-defense and in-the-home uh, weapon. Now, one of the things I do like, especially if you're using some of the uh, lighter shots, you know, the, the, I want to say probably from about uh, five, maybe a six shot up, up into the nines is that they don't have the tendency to go through drywall. Uh, so if you're concerned about accidentally discharging it and going through drywall uh, and especially two sheets of drywall into another room, then I would say, you know, probably your bet is going to be a, a smaller caliber um, shotgun, maybe a 410 or a 20 gauge and maybe carrying something like seven, eight or nine shot in it. Uh, that'll do a job on a human being, but you know it's going to be you're going to have a little bit of protection as far as the drywall. So he says, uh, uh, if you're on a budget, you might want to get a good quality bolt action rifle chambered in 308 or 30-06. Once again, we're going to say 30, 308 is going to be your better bet there because it accepts the 762 NATO, and that has been readily available, especially during the lockdown. A 12 gauge pump shotgun. Uh, with a spare riot gun barrel. So those barrels are on the 870 and on the 1100. Those are interchangeable. Uh, so all you need is the basic mechanism and they can change the barrels out. <clears throat> and he recommends a 22 LR rifle. I do as well. Um, I fell in love with and continue to love to this day the uh, Ruger 1022. It's a, it has a 10-shot rotary uh, magazine uh, that goes in from the bottom. And uh, th there are also aftermarket 25-round magazines that you can insert into it. Uh, you can, it has great uh, scope capability, iron sight capability, uh, just a fantastic little little saddle gun uh, that's just I, – I, I, I just love it. Uh, so uh, Remington – 1022 is what I recommend there. Although there are, the Marlin makes a fantastic weapon as well. Um, now, let's talk about one thing that I think a lot of people have, a especially those who are new to firearms, have a tendency to overlook, and that is uh, making sure you have plenty of cleaning supplies and making sure that you take care of your weapons on a, on a regular basis. So he recommends, uh, you know, cleaning it and then putting on rim oil. So what I will tell you is, is, in the Army, uh, we, and this was from my uh, maintenance kit for my, my M16, but we use uh, Break Free, and then we also use um, M-Pro-7. So I have a big spray bottle of M-Pro-7 here. But one of the things I, I want to point out is in modern smokeless um, gunpowder, you don't have to clean it quite as rigorously as we did say even 40 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm very impressed with the modern smokeless gunpowder uh, and, and how little residue at least. Now it does leave residue, don't get me wrong, that you should clean out, but you probably don't need to clean it out quite as frequently as we have in the past. He recommends Remington Rim Oil 
for your lubricant. Uh, I have been using hops uh, my entire, gosh, I, I got my first 22 when I was 12 years old. So that has to be 1964. So I've been using hops um, for a, a uh, uh, lubricant on my weapons, gosh, since 1964. And I'm very pleased with it. Um, haven't had any problems with it. Um, so, so that's, make sure you have plenty of patches, make sure you have a, a bore brush and, uh, and a, uh, uh, what do they call it? The thing you put your patches on, uh, patch rod, I guess, to go down your, your weapon, uh, make sure you learn how to clean it properly and, uh, and, and take care of it. Keep a light coil of oil on it, especially if you're in a, uh, high humidity area because it can be very, very prone to rust. Uh, do, don't ever put any anti-rust things or rust cleaner on it uh, because the bluing on the outside uh, is a form of rust. And, if, and I had a guy when I was in Germany, he had just gotten a whole bunch of, or no, he had just gotten in a Benelli um, um, skeet gun. Now he probably, and this was in 1984, he probably paid $1,200 for that shotgun. And he had it in his trunk, and one of his anti, one of his rust remover bottles went over, and took out the bluing on part of the barrel of that shotgun, and it was just unbelievable the damage it did. And we had to have it reblued and everything else. So bluing is a is, is a form of rusting. It's a controlled rust that that maintains or enhances the overall quality of the of the weapon to avoid any further rust. So you want to keep the bluing on there, but you don't want to take anything off with any kind of a rust remover or anything like that. Keep it, those kinds of things in a separate room away from everything else you have uh, firearms-wise. Uh, then he talks about um, uh, how much ammunition you need to store. And so he says, you know, for rifles, 22, 223, 308, 30-06, um, and, you know, with a budget, then he's talking about um, you know, make sure you have plenty. He gets into an actual number back here somewhere. Uh, where's that actual number that he gave us? I thought I had it highlighted, but, uh, you know, he, he's recommending somewhere around, uh, 500 rounds for each of your, your hunting guns, 2,000 self-defense rounds, um, 22 around 2,000 rounds. Uh, then he talks about night vision devices and, and uh, you know, the differences among the four different major night vision types. Uh, my three, one of my 308s is, is a uh, Ruger Gunsight Scout. And on it, I have a Vortex uh, what is it? Vortex 2 low light hog hunter scope uh, for low light conditions. And then hogs primarily, you know, you're going to hunt at dusk or at dawn. And uh, so this is a low light scope, not necessarily a night scope, but a low light scope. And so if you have plenty of moonlight, it'll work, you know, but uh, without, if it's, if it's the, the, the new moon, you're not going to get anything because, you know, there's, there's no light available to you. <clears throat> then he talks about selecting and assembling web, web gear uh, for your uh, weapons and how you're going to carry those. I recommend a good sling. Um, they even have a new single point combat sling for the uh, ARs. They're just phenomenal. Uh, you know, I still have the old web uh, sling. And, uh, you know, we were taught how to use that as a, as a standing uh, monopod, if you will. But uh, anyhow... I haven't moved up to, to the modern slings yet. I, I probably need to do that. One of the good things I would recommend, especially if you're going to do any long-range shooting, is, is get yourself a good bipod. Uh, and, and I find those extremely useful, uh, especially at targets. If you're, going to, if you're going to be shooting at 300 yards or further, uh, a good bipod is always fantastic. I, I, do, I would never recommend standing. Hi, Janae. I would never recommend a standing uh, position and trying to take a target 300 yards. I would say even 200 yards and further, you're going to you're you're getting into luck. Once you get at let's say a target that's 200 yards away, you probably want to be in either a sitting or a prone position with some sort of support 
uh, for your weapon so that there's you're not going to be lifting it as long or holding it as long. You know, one of the things you need to do um, is is some exercises. Uh, so you know, be, holding your weapon if it's going to be uh, a handgun, then holding it in a position for for extended periods of time, develop those muscles so that you have better muscle capability of holding that weapon for a longer period of time <clears throat> so that you have more accuracy in holding it on target uh, when that becomes a requirement. Same thing with your with your long rifle, your long gun. Uh, you know, make sure you hold it for extended periods of time so you get used to that weight, you develop some muscle uh, memory, and you develop some muscle capability as far as holding it. He's talking about you know, uh, getting a uh, Alice and Molly. Uh, of course, most of my stuff is from, you know, I, I retired in 1991, so my, most of mine is going to be Alice. Uh, I do have some modern, some modern Molly stuff, but not very much. Um, he talks about uh, AR or FM 2115, which is care of individual use and equipment, uh, care and use of individual equipment. And, and that includes your, your, your backpacks, your, your webbing gear, your, what we used to call the uh, LBE or load bearing equipment. So that looks like a, a pair of suspenders basically to hold up your pistol belt and anything else you might have on it. Um, he gives some recommendations on what he recommends for those, uh, especially if you go to a, a uh, Army Navy store he talks about uh, canes, walking sticks, and umbrellas for street self-defense. I, I am looking for a, I've done some cane training on, on uh, YouTube. For those of you who don't know, um, in my later years now, uh, I have become dependent upon a cane to walk. I have a, a I had a, a hip, total hip replacement and a hip fracture. And so that's still in the process of healing. Um, not any we're close to as mobile as I used to be. So if you want to call me a chairborne prepper, feel free to, because for the first uh, 45 years of my prepping experience, I was not chairborne, but for the last five years I have been. So uh, that is an accurate statement of my conditions now, uh, but uh, you know it does not in, uh, give you the idea of what they were the first 45. But now that I do have to use a cane, I would love to get a good cane uh, fighting uh, instructor and, and, and find that. Uh, we did do, I, I did study, um, oh gosh, now I'm going to forget it. That's one of the bad things about being a senior is you forget stuff. Um, martial arts for old farts, let's put it that way. How's that? How's that? The, uh, <clears throat> then he talks about knives and, and fighting knives and everything else. And, um, uh, so, so some of the things he didn't cover that I would like to add in uh, the, the book review is, you know, get as many magazines as you possibly can. This one happens to be to my, to, to, to one in particular, and I can tell you which one it is very simply, because once you get your magazines, uh, then I recommend you get a metallic pen. And these are basically a uh, felt tip um, metallic paint spreader. And then on all of the bottoms of every one, hi, Prepper Journey, how you doing? On the bottoms of every one of my magazines, I write exactly what weapon that magazine fits so that I don't have to guess. I can look at the bottom. As a matter of fact, here's my carry extra magazine. So you can, uh, you can see that that's got, you know, the, the, which weapon that is. That's a Smith and Wesson MMP. Um, and so, uh, you know, paint the bottoms of your uh, magazines. It, it comes in really critical if you have, let's say, both an, uh, uh, a Remington, I'm sorry, a, a Ruger Mini 14 and an, and an AR. Those magazines look an awful lot alike, but they are not interchangeable. So it becomes extremely important that you can rapidly identify which is which and which one you're going to put in. Uh, the next thing I'm going to recommend is get as many as possible. You know, I, I just showed you my haul video uh, from last week. Uh, my daughter gave me a $50 gift card to uh, uh, Academy. So what did I spend it on? Additional magazines. Um, you know, when I was in the military, uh, we always tried to carry as many magazines as we possibly could. 
And uh, then another thing I'm going to recommend is, and, and this is the one for pistols. Uh, so this is the Uplula. So let me show you how that works. Um, let me take one, one round out here. So what you're going to do is you're going to put the Uplula on your... Um, on your on your weapon, or I'm sorry, on your magazine. So a blue goes on the magazine, and you got this little black thing here that presses forward. So what you're going to do is you're going to press that forward. You're going to slide down on the magazine, and then that's going to give you enough space. I wish I had my cam amp camera at a different angle, where you can insert the new round, pull it off, and that round is now firmly seated. So you don't have to worry about doing a whole bunch of hand pushing with your thumb and manually doing it. I can load a magazine in one third the time, maybe even one fourth the time that somebody else takes to load a magazine uh, by hand. So, you know, make sure you have plenty of magazines. Make sure you have a high Rocky Mountain prepping. Make sure you have a way of rapidly um, reloading those magazines. Now, it's wonderful if you can get the, uh, the stripper clips uh, for the 5.56, five, and, that's, and that's going to be your weapon of choice. Uh, if you can get the stripper clips and the spoon, then with that, all you have to do is take the stripper clip and put the spoon on the magazine, put the stripper clip down, then you push it against the solid object, and those 10 rounds go bang into your magazine just right off the bat. Uh, so you can put 30 rounds in, I would say, in less than five seconds uh, if you, you know, once you get experienced at it. Uh, and we did, that's what we did to our weapons in the military is, you know, the spoon and, and stripper clip. So if you can get those, I strongly recommend it, buying your, your uh, uh, 5.56 in a stripper clip. So that kind of completes that chapter on um, firearms, self-sufficiency, and self-defense. Any questions or comments? from you all, what are your experiences concerning that or, or anything you might want to add or, or uh, uh, thoughts that you might have on how to even improve on what Mr. Rawls had talked about in the book? I'll give you a couple seconds there while I get a swig of water and, and uh, see if there's any comments. So just in case you haven't seen these before, uh, this is called the UP, UP, LULA, L-U-L-A. Um, this one is, is for anywhere from 38 up to 45. Uh, <clears throat> and they also have them available for other magazines. For example, uh, I have one for a 556223 magazine slightly different um, this one you, you 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 push it in pull it down lay the uh, uh, round in and then release it and the round is automatically seated <clears throat> on the one for rifle magazines you lay the round on top of the magazine and then push it in so it gives you a little bit of a, a leverage uh, a different way other than using your thumb <clears throat> so they are slightly different between pistol and, and rifle but I will tell you, they, they help you uh, load a magazine really quickly. And I think that's going to become very, very important. Okay. So the final cha the, the, the chapter 12, the final chapter we're going to discuss here tonight is what he calls get out of Dodge vehicles and the dread, dreaded trip out of Dodge. So we're going to be talking about his preferences as far as uh, vehicles. Now, remember, you want them basically to have a carburetor and points um, that the electronic fuel injectors may uh, be subject to EMP and may not work. Now, there's a guy by the names of James West, uh, I'm sorry, by, uh, by the name of uh, uh, Arthur T. Bradley, and that's the next book we're going to do in this series of discussing uh, nonfiction survival books. <clears throat> Mr. Brad, or Dr. Bradley is the EMP expert for NASA. So he designs all the, all the EMP stuff for all the uh, satellites and, and uh, spacecraft, the space shuttle and everything else. He is of the opinion 
that some of the vehicles may survive because, you know, you, in order to be affected by the EMP, now the long wire stuff, our, our electric transmission systems and distribution systems, those will definitely be affected. Anything that is plugged into that as a result will also be affected. But most of the micro stuff, it has to be in a perfect alignment to be horizontally intercepted by that wave in order for it to be affected. So he says there, there may be a portion of the vehicles, later vehicles post-1974, that will not be affected by EMP. It's all just depending upon luck and how you park your vehicle. Uh, but anyhow, he's talking about if you need four-wheel drive, uh, he prefers a Subaru, buy a Subaru, a used Subaru. Uh, he says, and preferably in the late 1960s to early 1970s, he says, and get a station wagon if you can with a big block engine, uh, which is going to be, you know, uh, collision resilient. Uh, so the get out of Dodge vehicle that he says is the best one is a flat brown 1970 Buick Estate station wagon. Uh, with a 455 cubic inch four barrel V8 engine. And he says, you can move any obstacles you encounter out of your way with that. Uh, and then he talks about motorcycles and, and uh, he talks about a 350 CC uh, dirt bike as being the most ideal. Um, so good to know how to drive a stand. Oh, absolutely awesome sauce. You are so right. As a matter of fact, here in Texas, uh, in 1967, uh, February of 1967, I was the last driver's ed class uh, at age 14 to get my driver's license, you know, full driver's license uh, in El Paso. And we had to take the driver's uh, the driver test with a stick shift, with a, 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 a manual transmission. Uh, part of that was they put us on an incline and uh, then it, with a stop sign, you were at the top of this incline, a hill, and then you had to put it in gear and then drive away from that incline without uh, rolling backwards in excess of one foot. So, yeah, that was that was fun back in those days. And I did this in a 1964 Volkswagen Beetle, and that was a lot of fun. Golly. Yeah, that's, that's good old memories. <clears throat> but he recommends... Uh, um, 350k uh, cc uh, dirt bikes. Now I happen to have, at, at the same time that I got my driver's license, when I drove to and from school, was a Yamaha DT1, which was a 350 cc dirt bike uh, with license plates, so I could drive it on the streets. And and uh, I, I liked, I loved that bike. Uh, the DT1 was a fantastic motorcycle, uh, but uh, the one thing I don't like about two-stroke engines is you know the, the amount of maintenance that's required for the exhaust system because you've got uncombusted fuel coming out and it gums up your your exhaust system so about i'm going to say probably once every 2500 miles once every two months you've got to burn your exhaust system uh i mean and i physically burn it put gasoline on it burn out all that uh gunk that uh, that has accumulated i prefer a four stroke now, four strokes are not as dependable in a dusty environment, you know, if you're going to do cross country or anything. That's where the two stroke really got their 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 fame was cross country enduro bikes. Uh, but for four uh, for for um, for other things, he recommends a Kawasaki KLR650 diesel uh, JP8 bike. So Kawasaki does manufacture a diesel motorcycle. And it can also uh, run on jet fuel, JP8. And it's a 611cc uh, equivalent of what the U.S. Army, the U.S. Marine Corps, and the U.S. Air Force use uh, for their security motorcycles. So that's his recommendation. Um, he also ha says he recommends having at least one E85 compatible vehicle or a fleet propane-powered vehicle. Uh, and then, of course, the E85 is also flex fuel vehicle capable. Uh, he doesn't care that much for electric ATVs. I don't either. However, uh, if you have a solar system, 
uh, then you know having something like an electric ATV or an electric golf cart uh, may be one of those chosen forms of, of uh, transportation because it'll be more readily available uh, to refuel it using your solar system. Um, diesel vehicles he likes, uh, he says the 1986 Mercedes diesel 300D is his preferred vehicle there. Um, I have a Ford F350 diesel, but I tell you that once again, because, you know, it's got, uh, it, it, and it's a flex fuel vehicle, uh, four wheel drive and everything else. But, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't think he has that much of a, an affinity towards the F350, uh, flex fuel diesel. Strongly recommends having run flat tires, man, are they expensive? Uh, I had to just replace tires on the F-350, and that was almost $1,000. So getting good mud tires for, for the F-350 was almost $1,100, and that was with a discount. Um, so he says, should you camouflage paint your vehicle? There's a guy down the street. Uh, man, I love it. He has an F-150, and it's got the urban camouflage, you know, the blacks, grays, and whites. And gosh, it just looks so good. I wish I had it. That's the only one I've seen. Uh, and that's really great for an urban environment. But he's talking about, you know, in uh, painting probably a woodland camo, camo or a desert camo on your vehicle. He says, yes, do that, but only after you've arrived at your bug out location. So have all your paints and everything else that you're going to use to camouflage your vehicle. But don't do it before SHTF because you'll stand out like a sore thumb and you don't want everybody coming to you. So do it after SHTF and after arriving at your uh, bug out location. Um, he talks about how to get uh, fuel in, in, in AW or in, uh, after SHTF. And he talks about the importance of having uh, two different things. I use stable. That's what I find. And then he's talking about use, finding Pry G from Nitro Pack. Uh, but I get the stable. I get that at, at uh, Walmart. And so one bottle of stable for every five-gallon can of gas. And that will prolong your gas for up to about a year. Now, then what I do after that is I've got, you know, a couple uh, five-gallon jerry cans of gasoline. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll take the first one. And, and when my truck gets to where it's starting to go down, and this is my, my uh, Tacoma, what I'll do is I'll put in uh, one about one gallon, it's approximate because I can't really tell because it's in a five gallon can, but about one gallon of gas from that one from the jerry can, and then refill the rest from the from Murphy's or or from uh, Costco, and uh, then so that'll take me through about four or five fuelings, and then I refill that gas can and I put it at the end. Now I have little uh, luggage tags. Uh, that I attach to my gas cans. And that luggage tag has the date that that gas can was filled. So I can always change the date and I can see how long that gas can has had fuel in it. Uh, so get yourself some luggage tabs and put those on your gas cans. And that can give you an idea as to how old the gasoline is in that five gallon can so that they don't go bad on you. And that's pretty much it. He, he talks about fuel storage. Um, I will tell you that if you're in a suburban or urban environment, uh, check with your um, homeowner's insurance. Uh, there are limitations. Uh, most insurance companies don't want you having too many flammables in your home if you have an excess, and they can prove it. If you have a house fire and you have an excess of that amount of flammables inside your home, it negates your, your fire insurance policy. Same thing with ammunition. If you have what they consider an armory in your home and you have way too many uh, rounds of ammunition in your home and they can bust, uh, you know, then that negates your homeowner's insurance as well. So, so if, I mean, we want this stuff for after SHTF, but we also have to keep it until SHTF. So we have to abide by things, you know, getting insurance claims if necessary, uh, before SHTF so that we have that stuff there available to us after SHTF. So make sure you comply with uh, any requirements that you may be um, either through your HOA or through your uh, 
a homeowner's insurance policy or anything like that. So that's basically the two chapters we have for discussion this evening. Uh, does anybody have anything else that they would like to add or any questions they would like to ask? And it looks like we have a fantastic group here who might be able to answer a lot of those questions if I can't. Uh, so how are we doing there? Do we have any questions or any other comments or anything people would like to share with others as far as their experience and their recommendations? I'll get another drink while we're waiting for those. Okay. So uh, I started this off. I was talking about the occurrences today in Europe. It appears that there were two explosions caused by flying objects. Uh, and, and, and the reason I say flying objects is because we don't know yet whether it was intentional with a, with a uh, guided missile or whether it was an accident through an unguided rocket. Uh, so I'm just going to say guided object or, or flying objects exploded in Poland, uh, which is a, a, uh, a NATO country. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm praying that this is an accident and that uh, um, the country I worked against for 21 years will make uh, sincere apologies to the families of the two people who, who perished and make restitution not only for the lives, but also for the property. Uh, and, and that this does not get uh, played out, um, that it does not be, that it is not considered as anything that warrants uh, activation of Article 5 of the NATO agreement. And, uh, you know, that this was just uh, something that cooler heads can prevail and avoid escalation over. Uh, so, you know, keep that in your prayers this evening that this does not escalate and uh, that cooler heads will prevail. Although, you know, I don't know how many cool heads there are left. So, um, hope that gives you uh, some insight as to Mr. Rawls's um, ideas about what we're going to have to have as far as self-protection and a get out of Dodge vehicle. So let me grab Exodus 4 that I should have, or I'm sorry, Numbers 4 that I should have member, memorized by now, but I don't. And seeing no further uh, questions or discussion or anything, uh, this is number 6, uh, verses 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. So remember, people, we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. Be kind, polite, and respectful to each other because togetherness is the key. We will be doing uh, the first week in December. I, so we got one more week left with Mr. Rawls's book. We'll take a week break, and, and then uh, we will start working on uh, Mr. Or, or Dr. Bradley's book, uh, and I have a link for it. I'll put a link for it in this uh, comment as well. Uh, but this is the book that we're going to start with two chapters on the, I believe it's the 5th of December, the first Tuesday in December. So take care, everybody. Please stay safe. Bye-bye.